Welcome to this regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. It is Monday, November 8th, 2010. Could we have the roll call by the town clerk, please? Chair Swift Kayata? Here. Councilor Guvenali? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. And Councilor Walsh? Here. Could you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Next on our agenda is the time when we um, have town council reports and correspondence, and I would like to lead off by um, congratulating Frank Governelli for his re-election. But mostly, uh, I would like to uh, thank Penny Jordan, Councillor Penny Jordan, for all her hard work on the council over the last two years. Penny has been a collegial voice of uh, sanity sometimes during some of our discussions. She's always known how to remain calm and uh, to get us focused on the long range and the big picture which are two very important things. Um, she's drawn on her professional skills from her work in the private sector uh, to keep us on track in many meetings. And uh, she has also served very ably as chair of the appointments committee and as probably most importantly, our liaison to the Cape Farm Alliance where she has done yeoman's work, more than yeoman's work um, for our community. So I just wanted to thank her. Um, we're sorry to see her go, but we know she's not leaving town or anything like that, and we'll be very active at her farm and in the Cape Farm Alliance and in many other um, organizations that she worked so hard for. So Penny, thank you very much for all your service over the past two years. We will miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other town council reports? Sarah? Bear with me, I have a few. Um, the first is about the Arboretum. Um, on Saturday morning, October 16th, I um, attended a ribbon cutting ceremony to launch the first of what will be many phases of the Arboretum. Um, it was an impressive sight, people showing up with clippers and hard hats and boots to clear the cliff walk to make way for plantings of the first of 12 phases of the Arboretum. They managed to clear half of it that morning and have had two subsequent work sessions and finished. Um, for those of you who don't know, the final goal is to have 15 planted landscapes all over the fort connected by pathways, um, much like the current Arboretum that you see at Booth Bay Harbor. Um, it's an extremely ambitious goal, but they are serious about it. Um, and if you want to learn more, Google the Arboretum at Fort Williams, and they have a beautiful new website that talks all about it. Um, as a follow-up, I attended the group's um, elegant fundraising event this Friday night at the beautiful Soli home on Shore Road. Um, the attendance there exceeded all their expectations. The place was packed with m many people of all ages and demographics. It was an impressive sight. And one of the things I was most impressed by was the many people who were there who are not from Cape Elizabeth. In fact, I spent the evening speaking to people from the West End and Falmouth and Yarmouth and Scarborough, all of whom are so excited about this project that they want to join in and help. Um, so they exceeded fundraising expectations and attendance. And um, to learn more about it, visit the website, or you can speak with Kath Catherine Bar 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 Uh, the second thing I had the pleasure of attending last Thursday, uh, November 4th in the morning, was the ribbon cutting ceremony for the new Cape Memory Care Center on Scott Dyer Road. Um, for those of you who have probably driven by, they took a very old and uh, falling down building and have renovated it into a beautiful new site, a 72 bed home for um, care of people with Alzheimer's and memory challenges. Um, Lon and Matthew Walters are the owners of the uh, Woodlands Company who are in charge of it. It's a family-owned, main based company, uh, very hands-on, warm, impressive, and it is open and they are accepting applications. So that was a um, delightful thing to, to be part of. And finally, I attended the CELT um, 
annual meeting last night at the Buzz, which was standing room only packed. It was a celebration of their 25th uh, anniversary, and so it was a, a, a pretty exciting event. All the founding members were there and were recognized. And they talked a lot about the work they've done this year and the goals that they've set. And Chris Franklin gave a re rather eloquent talk about the vision that has carried them through 25 years and how it still exists today and the progress that they're making on very impressive fundraising and increasing um, membership. And then that was followed by um, Colin Woodard, who's an author and was the keynote spe speaker who spoke about the ocean and coasts in Maine. Um, and I was, just couldn't help adding that Elliot Cutler and his wife Melanie showed up for the meeting. So uh, congratulations to CELT for all their incredibly hard work and uh, keep up their good work. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Other reports from anybody? Penny. I have two things. Um, first, I wanted to let people know that the um, appointments committee, we are currently interviewing people for the various boards and commissions, and we've had some wonderful applicants. We've got uh, another uh, night of uh, interviews, and then the recommendations will go before the council in December. Uh, but as always, there's been some phenomenal candidates. Secondly, what I'd like to do is um, uh, thank everybody uh, in this town for, uh, I guess, allowing me to be here on the town council. I've really loved every minute of it, uh, but there's only so much time, and I have so many things that I want to accomplish. Um, and that is mainly why I decided not to run again. Um, I need to focus on the Cape Farm Alliance. I want to focus on agricultural issues across our state. I want to focus on food security issues so that we ensure that nobody in Maine goes hungry. And I want to become more involved in the Farm Bureau because I want to work toward Maine once again becoming the breadbasket of New England. Um, and for all of those reasons, Plus, I have a person who sits at home as I attend all of these meetings, and I want to spend more time with my husband, David. And so I thank you all. I know that um, in the next few years, you may be seeing me running again, but until then, I really want to focus on agricultural issues. And I want to let my peers here know that I have all of your email addresses, and I'm not afraid to send you emails. <laughs> And I know you will see me standing at that podium many times, um, so um, it'll be fun being on the other side of uh, the issue. So thank you all very much, and thank you guys for bearing with me as I sometimes feel like the uh, lone voice on many issues. So thank you. Thank you, Penny. Uh, one other uh, item that I neglected to mention was we, we did have an election and I know it was a very um, long process for our town clerk, uh, Deborah Lane, and all her assistants and uh, election wardens and all the election workers, and it, it sort of lapped over to a more than 24-hour process because of all the write-in campaigns. So I wanted to recognize how hard you all worked and to thank you on behalf of our community for all the hard work that you and your various workers did, so thanks. Okay. If there are no more reports, uh, we have our first opportunity for citizens to speak on items that are not on our agenda. If anyone would like to come forward and speak on such an item or such a matter, please come forward to the podium and state your name and address. Okay, seeing none, we will move forward to the town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, Ann. I, I just wanted to make note of the activities of the last 24 hours. Uh, I think all of Cape Elizabeth lost its power last night, with the exception of a, a couple of streets uh, down around Seaview and Glen, uh, right at the South Portland Line down near the Cookie Jar. We uh, see one resident here that maybe kept his power on, uh, but that, that was about it. Uh, anyway, uh, it was, uh, for those of you that woke up last night, it, was a, it w wasn't a very pleasant night. And one of the main reasons the power went out to the degree that did in Cape Elizabeth was that one of the power, uh, the uh, utility poles that feeds the transformer in back of, right near the Jordan Farm uh, went out. Uh, the, the pole, one of the poles went down. 
uh, sort of more in back of Leighton Farms, and Central Maine Power was up there in the middle of the early morning hours in the dark uh, trying to get that full back up. And as a result of that, most of Cape Elizabeth uh, did get its power back uh, mid-morning, although there's, I think there's still a few, I think there's five different streets that are, or six different streets that are still listed uh, without power. But uh, just, you know, being in my own home and hearing that wind uh, and looking at some of the damage, you can imagine what it must have been like to be, to be out there in, in that power line area and uh, trying to get that pole back up. Also, uh, our fire department, public works were out all night, obviously the police. And uh, it's interesting for the, the you know, roughly 65 mile per hour gust winds, uh, there really wasn't a substantial amount of damage. We did uh, some of the, the, the former councilor Henry Berry, uh, we all remember the trees next to his home and how much he, he valued those and a couple of those again were lost in this storm, and they were scattered. Uh, there was, uh, I understand, a couple of vehicles in Elizabeth Park that uh, had a tree fall on them and got quite well damaged and you know, scattered here and there. And so, but, but regardless, again, everyone pulled together. and uh, Appreciate everyone's patient, uh, patience and especially uh, Central Maine Power again for uh, getting the power back on. It's uh, the spokespersons here this evening. Uh, to talk about a totally different other issue, and this has nothing to do with my comments on this with that issue, but uh, I think it is important to recognize the great work that they do in, in restoring power so quickly. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Our next item is to review the minutes of October 13th, 2010. Do I hear a motion? I move we accept the minutes of uh, October 13, 2010. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Are there any changes, corrections? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Next on our agenda is a public hearing having to do with our, the, uh, approving the annual update of the general assistance appendices that are sent out every year. Um, Mike, do you want to say anything as an introduction to this before we have the public hearing? Okay. Okay, I will declare uh, the public hearing open. If there's anybody who would like to speak on this item number 121, please come forward to the podium. Seeing that there's no one coming forward, I will declare the public hearing closed and move on to the actual item number 121. Do I hear a motion? Dave. Uh, I move that we approve the general assistance annual appendices uh, as submitted to us in our packets for tonight's meeting. Is there a second? Sir. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> The next item is item number 122, which has to do with a request to <coughs> install a temporary skating rink on town-owned property on Columbus Road. Um, Mike, or yes. is there anyone? I don't I know. I believe there are some members of the public here to speak on this, uh, based on uh, recognizing the number of people in the audience. This skating rink is on a, a piece of town-owned land. It's proposed to go. Uh, right as you, you go down Mitchell, you take a left uh, onto Columbus. It's on your left. They've staked it out. It's in the, the little grassy portion of that particular area. It looks rather, rather small when you actually look at the stakes that are, that are there. Uh, but there are representatives here that uh, I think probably might like to speak to this. And, uh, we have looked at the wetland issues, which was addressed in one of the, the okay. memos that you haven't seen and that, that you have seen. And Bruce Smith said there's no issues at all with, with wetland issues. Of, other setback issues. Okay, and I don't know if Neil Williams or the fire chief have been consulted. Are there any they, public they, safety issues that they, they have been? And I, uh, there were issues about lighting, and there were issues about how late it might go. And I'll, I'll hold off on commenting on okay. those until after the public. Uh, okay. And they didn't have a specific proposal. They just noted that, that there may be concerns with if there was lighting and if there was uh, late evening use. Okay. 
Great. Well, this is not an official public hearing, but um, per, according to the Town Council's uh, communication and other policies, anyone who wishes to speak on this item, please come forward to the podium and state your name and address, and you will have three minutes to make whatever points you want to make. Good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Gillespie. I'm a resident of 7 Columbus Road. And my name is Ethan, and I'm his son. <laughs> he also lives at 7 Columbus Road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ethan's favorite sport is hockey, and on October 19th, he drafted a letter to our neighborhood uh, requesting that we build an ice rink across the street from our house, which is a town-owned uh, piece of land. We prefer to put it in our yard, but we live on a, on a hill, so that's not possible for us. And in years past, the kids have typically skated in one of two locations, on a pond uh, that's in the town park, which is the wetland that was referred to, and it's, it's all overgrown now with no skating area really for the kids to use. The other area is um, probably a couple hundred yards for the house across from Columbus Road off of Mitchell, and it sits maybe 40 yards down into the woods. And there's some uh, general supervisory concerns among the parents, as it's a good ways away from our homes. Uh, with that said, what we're considering is a temporary structure that would be erected um, probably in mid-December and taken down when Mother Nature starts to melt. Um, the structure would be stored in my yard across the street at 7 Columbus Road, and its size would be 24 by 48 feet uh, with an 8 to 10 foot setback from Columbus Road to allow for plow clearance and shelving as the town plows throughout the winter. Um, there would be no alteration of the town land with the exception of the removal of the no dumping sign that's currently in the groomed area of the park, as well as roughly 38 stakes that would be like two by fours that would stake into the ground to hold the, the wooden structure that would be our rink. Um, we could do away with the stakes if, if that were a concern and we could talk about building a, more of a little different support for those boards. Um, we don't anticipate any lighting, and we have a very good neighborhood with a lot of support here tonight. We all communicate very openly, so late evenings shouldn't be an issue. It's about 75 feet from my bedroom, so if anyone's out there too late, I'll be sure to <laughs> walk across the street and ask them politely to leave. Um, some precautionary safety measures that we're taking. Um, the seating area or area where families can put their skates on will be approximately 15 feet from the paved road. There will be piping insulation on the top edge of our perimeter boards for safety concerns. And uh, any goals that are used for hockey would be approximately only four inches off the ice so the kids wouldn't have the ability to take a slap shot or lift the hockey puck at a, at a level that would, you know, could create bodily harm. And Ethan would like to read his proposed guidelines for the ice rink. Okay, so our proposed guidelines for the rink are skate at your own risk, Parental supervision preferred. 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. skating time. Be respectful for all skaters and their abilities. How must be fair for children. No cursing, no fighting, no slap shops, and no lifting of the puck. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Uh, good evening. Michael Hunter, 67 Columbus Road. Um, I just want to reiterate that I think this is a great idea. I think in this day and age where technology like computers and gaming and television dictate so much of our children's lives that an opportunity to get children out of the house at a time of the year that some kids don't really like to go outside all that much is, is great. It, uh, it's good exercise. And um, well, maybe I can skeet a few laps myself, but 100% um, for it, and I hope you'll take this into consideration uh, that the neighborhood and the, the, several kids have approached me saying that uh, they're awfully excited and they hope this happens. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Hi, my name is Sharon O'Neill, and I live at 56 Columbus Road. 
And I too think it's a great use of the space. Um, right now it's just being used for, well, not supposed to be used for dumping the leaves, but I only, I just had one question. I didn't know, Chris, because I didn't get a chance to ask you. If um, it's, is the intent for use by Columbus Road neighborhood and guests or? Absolutely. Okay, I just, I didn't know if. I, I will just note that the answer to that question was yes, just for anybody who might be watching on TV. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Anybody else who would like to speak? Hi, Laurie Roberts, 47 Columbus Road. And I just want to applaud Ethan for his initiative on um, approaching you about putting this ice rink in. They do live right on the corner of Columbus and Mitchell Road. And he does love to play hockey. And when you come around the corner, sometimes he's there. And he's very courteous to get out of the road. But I think it's a great opportunity for them to have a way to still play hockey and be much safer than being in the street. So I do applaud him for taking his initiative and for writing his lovely letter that he wrote and hand delivered to the entire neighborhood. And I fully approve it. And so does my family. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? <clears throat> My name is Don Welly, 25 Thrush Road. Uh, I think the, the idea is great. It gets the kids out of the house, like we just mentioned before. It gets them away from the TV. And I think this, this project today has, I think, brought the neighborhood together. Um, it's brought everybody's come together, and they want to they build this project for the, for the neighborhood. And I think it's great to see that uh, these days as a neighbor, neighborhood coming together and working as a team and getting this thing done. So I uh, strongly support the idea. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Hi, I'm A.J. Danino from 1 Cedar Ledge Road. I just don't know if I quite heard Miss Heard or not, where this is on public property, are kids from across town going to be turned away? This is a private structure on a public property, and if they go to the town pond down by Fort Williams, everybody gets to use it, everybody expects to use it. We're talking about public property, I have that question. I just Look. confirmed with the manager, and I think the intent of the proposal is that anyone will Good. be able to use it. I don't know if I heard it right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I would reiterate it is on public property. So. Hi, I'm Eric Olson. Um, I live on 31 Kildeer Road. Um, and I think this has been a, a wonderful idea that the Gillespie's have taken on. I think it's, uh, it's great that uh, you guys are sort of, I, I think Ethan is learning more about how the government process works than he probably ever wanted to. Um, but uh, I, I, I applaud him for not doing what a lot of kids would do at his age, and that's, uh, you know, it's always easier to ask forgiveness than permission and they went around and they asked permission of the whole neighborhood um, and uh, we're here now to uh, support that and hopefully uh, the permission will be granted. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Good evening, my name is Paul Loverty. I live at 29 Thrasher Road. Both Ian and I think that Ethan has done a wonderful thing of asking the town to have the skating rink. Uh, and I do believe it will be a safer uh, situation for, for them because Ethan and his friends are in the street uh, coming off of Mitchell Road. Uh, everyone is careful. We know kids are in the neighborhood. And uh, I, I think this is a, a very good idea. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, I want to thank everybody for um, their comments, and now we will move on to the agenda item, actually. The actual item, which is the request to install a temporary skating rink on town on, uh, land on Columbus Road near the intersection with Mitchell Road. Do I hear a motion? Sarah. I move we accept the request to install a temporary skating rink on the town park land on Columbus Road. 
Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I have a question of the manager. Um, can you confirm for us if all of the abutters been informed? We, we sent a letter out to everyone in the Columbus Road. Someone has it there. In the Columbus Road neighborhood and the, the abutter across the street on Mitchell and on the, the two heads of Mitchell mm -hmm. on either side. But the, the, the one right across, I don't know if we sent it to the, that next lot down okay. that's for sale, but uh, we did send it to the one right across. Okay. But did you get that on Friday? Friday, okay. Yes, okay. But the, the house that abuts this town land directly to the left. The Skillens which, house that I is, was. It was, was, okay. They someone else owns it now, it's not And Skillens. they were in they, they received the letter. Okay. It was sent to them. Right. I don't know if they received it. Because they have bought this specific piece of property. I understand. Different than some of the people that have spoken today. Mm -hmm. yeah. but when I went over, I made sure three different times that, that house was included. I was very sensitive that they, they do receive the most impact. Yeah, I think it's the Tiberius. Yeah, it is. Wall. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm just concerned that they haven't weighed in here publicly, or maybe they've called the town. No, we, we have not heard from them. We sent them a letter, and, you know, okay. that's all I can say. All right. Just a, just a question. That's all. Okay. Yes, Jessica, and then Dave. I think um, it's a wonderful idea. My only question is, um, do uh, if if it goes forward, and I certainly hope it does, do we need to run this by the town attorney for liability issues? That's my first question. Number two, is there any kind of precedence like that that would help in considering liability issues? Mike. Uh, let me answer the question in two ways. Anything that happens on town property, we have responsibility for. Uh, under the Maine Tort Claims Act, we do have immunity from, from typical parks and recreation thing. When there begin to be structures on a property such as this one, uh, the, the liability increases, the responsibility increases. I usually approach these things uh, if, you know, no matter what we do, we have liability, and if we were always concerned about liability, we'd never do anything. Uh, but but there, there is a risk uh, that, uh, and we do have insurance for it, but there is a risk that someone could make a claim that it wasn't constructed right, that we somehow allowed something dangerous to happen, and that's the, just, you know, that's everyone's right to bring those claims forward if they so desire. Thank you. Is there any more discussion? Dave, did you have something? No, I, I also think it's a great idea, and we'll definitely vote for the in favor of the motion. Um, and as far as the Tiberius property is concerned, I've been there before and I think they're pretty well shielded from where this rink would be in terms of there's, like, there's trees and, and, and then the driveway and then their house. So I, I'm totally comfortable moving forward. Any other comments or discussion? <clears throat> Frank? I also support this. Just want to know, have there been any complaints or concerns raised by anybody in the neighborhood that we should be aware of? I did receive uh, one telephone call from someone up towards the end of Columbus Road that expressed concern with safety. Uh, the end, the end, the way at the, the, far, the, far, the far end, far end of Columbus, the far end of Columbus, that expressed concern about safety and you know the kids out near the street, uh, potential noise, those those types of issues. That was upon receiving the original letter from. Uh, Ethan, uh, I didn't receive any additional word from the citizen Friday or today, but you know, obviously today a lot of folks didn't have phone service. And, uh, you know, I, that's a fact. So. Okay. Sarah. Um, I just wanted to say that a resident on our, in our neighborhood on Manor Way, Bill Betchenstein, did this very same thing, put in a rink, and it was just a great thing for the neighborhood. We'd all go and skate, the kids would help, we'd shovel it, blah, blah, blah. It, it really brought the neighborhood together. It was wonderful. I will say as a caveat that you, you ought to speak to Mr. Betchenstein before you do it because it's an absolutely enormous amount of work. <laughs> give him a call. He'll give you everything to do and don't do. Jim. And just a, a further question. Um, has uh, Neil Weems been brought up to speed about this request in terms of parking and egress and all the rest? because I know there's some specifics in here about where the kids will lace up and get, you know, take care of putting skates on and, and so forth. 
I just, I'm just curious because it is at the corner, even though it may seem like it isn't, it is at the corner. Yeah, the, for anyone who knows the chief of police, he likes to make sure kids are safe mm -hmm. and he likes to work with them to accomplish the things that they want to accomplish. Yeah. And while, while I don't think he knows every last mm -hmm. detail of this, uh, he, he did discuss it at the department head meeting and his only concerns were that the police might be getting complaints about lighting and we've heard tonight that there wouldn't be any lighting, uh, additional lighting over what's, what's already there. And the second thing, his suggestion he was a little nervous about the 9 o'clock time and thought, eh, maybe it ought to be 8 o'clock, but he did not make a, a mm -hmm. hard and fast recommendation on that. Okay. And I want to go on record as my kids played hockey in that uh, pond that is on Mitchell Road behind the land that I happen to own. And there are lights in the trees that are still there <laughs> from back when the kids did that. <laughs> and my kids now are 25 to 30, so uh, you can understand how long ago that was. Again, I applaud this young man's uh, effort, and uh, going through the public process is not easy, but it certainly has been a learning experience, I'm sure, for him, and it has been for me. Any other comments? I, too, will be supporting this. I think it's a great idea. It shows good initiative, and uh, I think it's great that the um, neighborhood can work together on this, and I applaud Ethan and his father and his friends. And uh, neighbors for um, pulling this together. So, we, do I hear, um, we did have a motion and a second, so all in favor? It's unanimous. Congratulations and good luck with building. Feel free, we can take a 30 second break here if anybody who is from the neighborhood that doesn't want to sit through the rest of our meeting wants to leave. Okay. Moving on, we come to item number 123, which has to do with the draft resolution regarding smart meters. And before we go forward with this, I'd like to stay, say that I will need to recuse myself from this matter. My husband is an attorney and CMP is his client, and therefore I have conflict of interest. So I'd like to ask the council to vote to recuse me. I'll make that as a motion. And moved and seconded. All in favor of recusing me? It's unanimous. I will step down then, and Sarah Lennon will take over, and I will return um, for the next item. Thank you. Okay, so taking up item 123, 2010, um, now is the time, the opportunity for citizens uh, to speak on this agenda item. Um, Come forward, state your name and address, and I'd ask if you can stay within the three-minute limit. That'd be great. Thank you. My name is Ange Foley, and I live at 14 Beverly Terrace in Cape Elizabeth. And I'm here tonight to talk about smart meters and the resolution you have before you. CMP has made clear their intentions of installing smart meters in, on every home in Maine. They state this on their website and in the news. As recently as Friday's WGME broadcast, that they will assert their right to complete the smart meter installations across Maine. They have not made clear the health, safety, and privacy issues their customers face when smart meters have been installed on their home. Wireless smart meters are assessed for safety compliance and isolation using FCC radio frequency safety standards for short-term thermal effects, five and 30 minutes, and are configured for a six foot two, 200 pound man. They have not been assessed for safety in a wireless mesh network in which they are designed to operate, or in combination with multiple meters or other sources of radio frequency, such as Wi-Fi, digitally enhanced cordless phones, cell phones, cell towers, and more. It is known that each wireless smart meter sends off a signal, a strong pulse, 100 times over a 24-hour period day and night. But CMP uses an average of this daily exposure to non-ionized radiation at these high untested levels when assuring customers that their exposure to a smart meter is that none other than technology being used today. 
Their average does not take into account living in a neighborhood of wireless smart meters. Each smart meter's peak pulse is, synch is not synchronous with surrounding homes meters. CMP does not take into account the thousands of transmissions we will be exposed to on any given day in a neighborhood of smart meters or homes with multiple meters. CMP also fails to mention on their webpage that each peak pulse of a smart meter is 10 times that of a Wi-Fi hotspot. There are safer alternatives, which include hardwired cable, phone line transmissions, and fiber optics. All have been used elsewhere. Smart meters and their network of wireless equipment are an untested technology. We tried to become informed of the health, safety, and privacy concerns as quickly as possible because installations are happening throughout our community. CMP disputes these health concerns by hiring Exponent, a scientific engineering firm internationally known for downplaying health cases as rep they've represented the tobacco industry, asbestos, and more recently, Toyota's faulty brakes. Many have written that manufacturers' rush to meet production demand has created a less than optimal security levels, endangering privacy. CMP's assurance that their in-house smart meter team is considering an opt-out program seems insincere when this past Friday night on Channel 13, covering a story about CMP smart meters being a threat to national security, and the story ended with CMP's assertion that every last smart meter will be installed. What will we be able to say to our generation of youth 20 years from tonight when statistics are available I'm hopeful we will be able to assure them that Cape Elizabeth joined other communities in Maine to ask for more time to answer questions regarding smart meters. We took time to ask the questions and provided residents with answers from a source not hired by a company so eager to install these wireless meters on the side of our homes. Thank you for tonight's opportunity. Thank you very much. Someone else? Good evening. I'm Elisa Boxer and I live in Scarborough where uh, town councillors are happily hoping you will join them with a 90-day moratorium that we are all hoping CMP will honor. Um, I grew up in Cape Elizabeth and actually babysat the chair's <laughs> daughter. Still have family here so this is still home to me. Um, growing numbers of physicians are actually contacting me saying that they, unlike the state's public health director, see inconclusive science as reason to go slow rather than reason to proceed with smart meters. Um, one of those physicians is a Cape Elizabeth resident who could not be here tonight, but she asked me to read a letter on her behalf, and I have a copy of the letter for you. Her name is Karen Emery, and I believe she lives on Ocean View. And I'll read quickly because this is three minutes. Dear town councillors, as a pediatrician, a parent, a Cape Elizabeth resident, and a CMP customer who unknowingly had a smart meter installed and then was told I did not have the right to have it removed, I strongly support an immediate moratorium on installation of any new smart meter and related equipment until independent research can be done on the cumulative effects of these mesh networks that, by design, expose us to the transmissions of every meter in our area. I believe it is crucial to err on the side of caution with high-frequency wireless technology that adds multiple new layers of RF exposure since the U.S. allows products on the market until they are proven harmful. And some populations are already experiencing sensitivity to this technology. Given the ongoing international dialogue and debate over the safety of wireless radiation, given the growing body of scientific literature indicating the potential for everything from DNA breaks to various forms of cancer, as a result of long-term non-thermal exposure, and given the inadequate FCC standards that only cover acute thermal exposure, I believe the burden of proof should be on industry to prove safety before these wireless networks are set up to cover our streets, our yards, and our homes. Our children are, all, are already exposed to so many potential toxins in our environment. Due to their body mass, they're exposed to 10 to 20 times more than the average adult, 
with thinner skulls and rapidly developing brains, organs, and systems. They are also the most vulnerable to these potential toxins, which include bursts of wireless transmissions at high frequencies, such as the 2.4 gigahertz smart meters and other equipment on our utility poles, lampposts, and homes. I do not believe we should install smart meters and wait for the science to conclusively show no risk because by then it will be too late, especially because medical professionals elsewhere are calling for bans and moratoriums on smart meter installation in light of people becoming ill. As part of Maine's medical community treating our most vulnerable population, I believe we need to halt installation long enough to hold community-wide and statewide meetings discussing both sides of the science not simply presenting CMP's hired experts showing no cause for concern, especially when those hired experts are from a firm that has represented the tobacco industry in secondhand smoke cases. At the very least, we should have a choice. We also need to work together to protect populations who maintain Wi-Fi free homes because of symptoms like headaches, nausea, muscle pain, and heart irregularities upon exposure to wireless devices. These patients will literally have nowhere to go to recover. They will lose their homes as safe havens, and we as a society need to prevent that from happening. We owe it to our children and to future generations to ensure the safety of their environment. There should be no rush to install these devices. Unfortunately, technology is outpacing the scientific research. We should be making sure that this technology will not be causing long-lasting ill effects on our population, prior to implementing it. As the Hippocratic Oath states, first, do no harm. And that is from Karen Emery, MD, from Maine Health Pediatrics in Falmouth. But again, she is a Cape Elizabeth resident. And I have a copy of this for you. Thank you so much. And I know I went over three minutes. I apologize. Thank you, Ms. Boxer. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Merrill, and I live at 51 Cottage Farms Road, and I hate doing this sort of thing, but um, <laughs> I strongly agree with that letter that was just read. Um, I just think that there's too many unknowns, and I just think we need to be better educated before we proceed forward. It may be perfectly safe for us, but I just don't think we have the hard numbers. I think some of the numbers are averaged over a 24-hour time period and not when it's my understanding is that it is a short burst that our meters are on for and so that I'm just I'm uncertain as to the numbers and I just think that we need to be better informed I did actually have a very nice conversation I had my smart meter removed from my house a very pleasant conversation with CMP about it um, the initial person said no I can't have it done but when I asked to speak to the, uh, their manager they were happy to take it off and she, you know it's a very pleasant conversation but even she couldn't tell me the amount of exposure that I would have. She, could, she did not have a number at that time, and so that was not at all comforting to me. Um, you know, I said, things were said like it was the same as a cell phone or this or that, and you already are around, you know, surrounded by it. And for me, I don't know, does that mean because a teaspoon of sugar on your cereal in the morning is okay, that two cups is okay? Um, you know, and the PCU has approved it, well, you know, I'm, I'm not an alarmist or anything, but or uh, naysayer necessarily, but I think we just have to look critically at things. The FDA has approved food that I wouldn't put in my mouth also. So um, I just think we need to be better informed before we proceed forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Anyone else? Hi, my name is A.J. Danino from One Cedar Ledge Road. I hadn't thought about speaking this evening. I'm here for my son who's here in a Boy Scout project observing government and process. And I'm old enough to remember when they said, DDT won't hurt you. It's fine. We can spray it from the street. I remember watching the street, spraying us down the street. We were sitting on the front walk and they sprayed all the trees where I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm old enough to remember that they said that Agent Orange wouldn't hurt anybody. But Dow Chemical said it was just fine. 
It was for a profit. It went fine. We know how that is. We're dealing with it now. We're paying for it now. This is the same kind of process. We know the only reason that CMP is putting this onto the homes is to save money, save jobs, increase profit. It's not going to lower our cost of energy. It's not going to make us any better off other than it's easier for them. The science, the radiation, the issues have not been proven. They have been discussed. It's just way too soon to even say, yes, come and put it on my own. I certainly will not permit it in my home. No one, no one in the news, in the discussions, has ever stood up and said, wait a minute. Just think about how that sounds in comparison to those other examples I gave you. There's a hundred more in between. We have just got to say enough's enough. We just have to stand up and say, this is our home. You want to do business in our community. It comes with a standard. A standard of care, a standard of thoughtfulness, a standard of responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more person. Mm -hmm. My name is John Carroll. I'm with Central Maine Power. I'm not a resident. Um, and I just want to start by saying on behalf of people at CMP, thank you, Mike, for acknowledging what they do. They're, it's pretty miraculous, I think, what they accomplish. I actually woke up this morning in, in Poughkeepsie, New York, on a college tour, and my wife was calling to tell me the power was out at 5 a.m. and asking what was up. And I said, you're the one, you know, you're the one back home. So, uh, but we'd already been on calls, and, and the company was on alert and at it all night, and... Uh, it's not going to be tonight before we're done. It'll be tomorrow. But thank you, and I appreciate that. Uh, before I, I know, I know we're limited in time, but I wanted to um, just start by saying, you know, trying to address your concerns here tonight, I, I'd hope you'd reconsider the request before you for a couple of reasons. One is that um, there are opportunities to learn more um, already. And then secondly, I think in some respects we may have addressed some, so we may have addressed some of the concerns in here. But I want to just start by, you know, this, this discussion about smart meters has been suddenly gone down this road about health concerns. And um, as a gentleman before me just said, you know, there's only, there are no reasons for this, uh, you know, when perhaps we haven't articulated them, but the reasons go far beyond a, a self-interest of CMP. Um, and I just want to just run through a couple of those quickly. We're replacing a technology that is, if you think of it as the telegraph, which is really it's contemporary from a technological perspective, um, provides one piece of data once a month, um, only when you go and look at it, 620,000 of these things. We visit once a month, somebody drives up and gets out and looks. Um, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great technology. It's, been, it's very reliable. It's reasonably accurate. It um, is easy to maintain. Um, and it has been around pretty much since the telegraph, un largely unchanged. Electromechanical meters are unchanged, certainly in the last 60 to 70 years. Very little real advancement. The technology we want to put in, the, we call it an AMI, it's a, it's a larger infrastructure, advanced meter infrastructure, is really, I, I think, the comparison would be a telegraph and, a, and the iPhone. And I choose iPhone because this is a technology that is uh, instantaneous, it is interactive, and it is t entirely integrated. Um, and, and in some respects, I, I think the fact that people haven't said it earlier, it's a shame on CMP um, in this day and age when people can go on the web and find out almost anything instantly. Um, and yet we are going out to their house once a month just to find out uh, how much electricity they've used. Um, so this is something that uh, we are doing for good reasons. And frankly, I think the people in your community should value. Um, just some of the benefits. This is from primarily for consumers. It's about information and choices. It gives them information about their usage, for how much they're spending. 
It gives them information about their carbon footprint if they want to see it in, the, in terms of their energy use. Um, with this information, studies have shown that uh, off the top of, you know, anyone who takes an interest in it will quickly save anywhere from 5 to 15 percent as they begin to understand how they use energy and, and use it and that more carefully. Um, it, it has the potential long term to allow customers to begin using real time pricing. Energy prices are much more dynamic than the, than the, the very slowly uh, changing energy price we see today. It changes once a year by about a third of the price. Um, in fact, energy prices change almost by the minute and consumers are entirely isolated from that. Commercial and industrial customers have been taking advantage of those price breaks and price advantages for years. They're more sophisticated. They have more sophisticated uh, technology. This is democratizing that opportunity, really, for every homeowner. I know. I know. Um, and finally, it also allows customers remote control at, at some point. They'll be able to control their own household appliances remotely. This is an empowering technology. In terms of the environment, you eliminate two million miles of driving a year. This is the technology you need to start shaving off the peak energy use, which is when the, the dirtiest plants run, Cousins Island, when it fires up at those peaks. This is the way you address that peak. And this is a critical technology for integrating renewable resources, be it wind, hydro, tidal. Um, this is what you need. You need time of use technology. Um, and then finally, for us and our customers, this is certainly going to improve our operations. In, in myriad ways, but <clears throat> I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. Sorry. Pardon me. You got to wrap up. You used okay. your three minutes. May I ask for another three minutes? N no, I don't think so. I can't ask for three more minutes. It's a council rule, especially because it's not a public hearing. He, he can ask. One. He can ask, and the council, by a two-thirds vote, can say yay or nay. Can I just chime in? If, if the focus would be on the health issues, I understand all the efficiencies that we might realize. Uh, it's, we, trucks wouldn't be going to every customer's home, so that's good for the environment. But I w if we're going to allow additional time, I want them to address the, the health concerns. How about two minutes on health? Two minutes on health. Okay with that? We, is, do we have two? Yeah. But, I, I am. Is everyone else okay on that? Yeah. Okay. I'm not a health expert. So if, and I want to be clear, I'm not going to address on a point-by-point -point basis the health issues. And if you don't want to hear any more, I don't want to abuse you, your, your, your indulgence here. But I would maybe, let me start indirectly by talking about the health issue. The, one of your requests is that the PUC should take this question up to study the health issue. Okay, that is one of your, part of your resolution. That is in fact, that is already in process. A case has been filed with the PUC the PUC has received some testimony from us. They have received testimony from Dora Mills, the state health expert. I hope all of you got that today, uh, although maybe with a power outage you didn't get it. Um, she has weighed in on the health issue. The Public Utilities Commission will address this question from a health perspective. Um, so that is already in, in, uh, underway. Your other concern about access to health information. Um, this, this council has never asked us to come to this town. We've never been invited here to make a presentation on the health issue. Um, but certainly, the health, the information we provided and will provide and Dora Mills has provided is on the Public Utilities Commission website. It's docket 210-345. That is all there for the public at any time to read. Whether they accept it or believe it or, or uh, is a separate issue, but the information is out there and that's something you're asking for. <coughs> um, what you've heard, so far, are characterizations of the technology, the science, the regulations, our consultants, uh, Dora Mills' uh, opinions. But those are only, you've heard only other people's characterizations. Um, you, if you wanted us to come here and, and talk about it, from our perspective, we would certainly do that. But what I would say is that your decision to vote on this is not entirely trivial because you're voting on a, out of a health concern. Um, and we're using a technology that is probably in your schools, it is in this building, it is in your fire, your police, it is probably in every public building. And you as an employer um, and also as a, an agency that manages public accommodations are raising a health issue about a technology and I question, I think I want to raise the point, what, whether you've done the due diligence to make a decision like this. Um, because. If you listen to us, we would say that the technologies are very similar. The health risks are very similar. And so before you act, I guess I would say, 
we have addressed these concerns, and as you raise this as a health issue, I would ask, have you followed a similar due diligence yourselves? Because if you understood it the way we understand this technology, you might realize you may have already embarked on this, on this you know, committed yourselves to a health concern, maybe without your own due diligence. So. Thank you very much. We, people have questions. We'll call you back. Uh, so that's the end of the past, well past the end of the time for citizens to speak. So do I have a motion? Do you want me to introduce the draft? Yes. Yeah, it, uh, thank you, uh, Acting Chair. Sarah. Uh, I, I do, did want to point out, we did draft a, a uh, draft motion of resolution. Uh, and and it, it makes no judgment, pro or con, about health uh, on either side. What it does, it, it mentions that, that CMP was given permission in February to install these meters. Uh, it says that, that you understand that CMP has begun installing them. It says that citizens have expressed concerns about the installation of smart meters, meters relating to health concerns and privacy. It merely says the concerns have been expressed. It reaches no conclusions. Uh, <clears throat> another important point, it says, whereas the PUC, in approving the program, did not consider possible health impacts or give adequate consideration to privacy concerns, that when it was considered in February and the permission was granted, CM CMP has not disagreed with that uh, provision. Uh, they, as far as I know, have admitted the fact that they didn't look at health concerns, privacy concerns at that time. It simply didn't come up. Uh, and so what you're then resolving under this draft is urging CMP not to install for a period of 90 days, smart meters, repeaters, all the related equipment, and until they've provided citizens, local, uh, locals, residents, additional information on the plant's installation. And two, uh, really the PUC is the one that regulates utilities. It's not individual towns. And the, the second resolve is that you urge the main PUC to, uh, to provide an appropriate mechanism for, for local residents to voice their positions for or against any smart meters before any smart meters are installed. Okay. If you notice that, you're asking for a form for and against. Again, you're not taking a position pro or con. Uh, you're simply asking for, for issues to be looked at that weren't previously looked at under this, uh, under this proposed draft. Obviously, this is just a proposed draft the council could move whatever draft it chooses. Thank you. You're welcome. Do I have a motion? I'd like to move that we, uh, that we accept the resolution as proposed to draft to the council. I second that. Discussion? Dave. Um, I, I believe I will plan to support the motion. Um, the only suggestion that I have is in the Fourth, whereas, where it says, whereas the Public Utilities Commission in approving the AMI program did not consider possible health impacts or give adequate consideration. That's our understanding. So I was just wondering if the council would be willing to say, to put a qualifier at the beginning of that statement that, we, that it's the town council understands that the PUC in approving the AMI program, blah, blah, blah. Because I just don't know if that's our understanding tonight, but I don't know if that's true, and I just don't want us to be quoted as saying something that may, may not, in fact, be true. So it's our understanding. We're going on the, on the basis of that. If, if it's not true, well, then so be it. So the, the person, in, I made the original. Are you so willing to I'm accept that so, amendment? So I move it with the amendment. It's the council's understanding under the fourth bullet, whereas. Yes. <coughs> And you need a second on that amendment? Another second. Second. Okay. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. I guess my question to this <clears throat> resolution is, so what? I mean, we, we adopt this resolution. We, we are urging CMP and we're urging PUC to do things, but it's simply an urge. We don't have any power as a council to stop this, or do we? Are you? Uh, <clears throat> I don't believe so. Uh, but what, you, what we would do if you pass this is we would send it to Sarah Burns, the president of Central Marine Power Company, and we would file it with, with the, uh, the docket that was referenced uh, at the Public Utilities Commission. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can, 
My concern is that, okay, if, if this is saying, if this resolve resolution is saying, yes, this is our statement, and, uh, but yet there's no real meat behind it. My concern is that citizens in a, in a town who own homes need to have choices about what happens to their home and with their home. And I would think that there's, this needs by CMP to be taken seriously that there are people in the town who don't want their homes touched. And I recognize that within uh, what the PUC adopted that choice in Maine isn't one of the elements, but somehow we need to get that point across. And I don't, <coughs> I would hope that each town making resolutions like this would help that happen. So does it really mean anything if we do this resolution? Is it going to make a difference? Jessica? Well, I would recommend that we add um, under, just see the now therefore be it here resolved as follows, that we have one and two. And I would recommend that we add a number three, which would be an opt-out provision, as Scarborough did. Ah. And so, and I, you know, and I don't know whether that ultimately would be valuable in the terms of does that really affect the non-ionizing uh, radiation frequency that's flying around? I mean, if, if I opt out, does it really make a difference to my neighbor if I opt out? I don't know. But to speak to Penny's point, my thought was, before I came in here having read this, is that perhaps an opt-out provision be added to this resolution. Again, whether it's even doable, I don't know, but it, it seems to me it would be one way in writing to say, gee, you know, it might be a good idea to offer our townspeople a choice. One lady that spoke was able to do that. Um, you know, again, is it realistic? I don't know, but it seems that it might be worthwhile including that in writing. Okay. Would, that, excuse me, would that be opt-out for the individual homeowner? You're not saying as a town. No, I'm sorry. Good point. Thank you, Jim. No, for the individual homeowner. Okay. Um, and, and if that's reasonable, doable, I, I think that could be explored. Can I ask, add one more question, and then you'll answer them all? My understanding is that this is really just saying, can we please pause for 90 days? And within the pause, if we vote yes, we want to pause, then I had understood that all these other um, concerns and questions would be addressed and, and, and perhaps a committee would even be formed that would put forth various possibilities and I would think that would be a strong one to include. So that's my question to the manager. Is, it, is this not just a pause and that, that later we would figure out what we want to do with the pause? You know, th that's up to the town council. I do want to address uh, Councillor Sullivan's, uh, Jessica's comment. You know, CMP currently offers an, an ability to opt out one reason you might want to put a three in is, you know, part of why you pass resolutions is not only to indicate to these two agencies, uh, the PUC and CMP, but it's also a part of a, a public knowledge effort uh, that the public is aware of the opt-out provision. Uh, so they would be made more aware of it. Uh, and CMP, you know, does, when they go out now, they put tags on doors saying they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And particularly if people have known health issues, there's provisions that uh, they can say, no, it, it's not coming in. But some of those issues still ultimately will have to be worked out for the PUC. And, you know, I, the one thing I'm not sure by what I've heard uh, is that C uh, the Public Utilities Commission works. You can sign a 10-person complaint with them, which is what uh, some citizens and primarily Scarborough did. And ultimately, it's up to the PUC of whether or not it opens up a case and has a full, full review of the case. To my knowledge, CMP, the PUC has not yet opened up the case. And the issue is, does the PUC want to reopen the case? And they do have the ability to do that. I just say that with different options of what you might consider. Um, I had the same understanding that Sarah Lennon had in, in terms of this 90-day pause. Uh, but I'm, could, could, Jessica, could you read the, the opt-out yeah. provision? Because I just don't have it in front of me. Yeah, sure. It's um, in Scarborough's resolution, they had an opt out provision that's on the bottom, number four, and it states 
The Scarborough Town Council urges CMP to modify its AMI program. AMI is Advanced Metering Infrastructure. Modify its AMI program to provide that individual consumers can choose not to have wireless smart meters installed on their properties or use hardwire types. So it's, it's pretty brief. But I think it's worthwhile to include, again, as a public education, I think, issue. And I would also point out that we just have a little typo in the first paragraph where AM, it says AMT, <laughs> and I'm sure that's supposed to be AMI in the very first whereas paragraph. Frank and then Jim. I would agree with the Justice's proposal. I think it is a little bit out of context with the recommendation. However, uh, from my point of view, one of the strongest arguments for delaying this is the privacy issues and the control of your own property. Mm -hmm. And uh, requesting that the opt-out <coughs> request be in here makes that point strongly. I don't think we're, we as a town or any town is ever going to be in a position to determine whether the health issues are valid or not valid. <coughs> but we certainly can voice our concerns and our own personal opinions as it relates to control of our own private property and uh, adequate prior notice on it, things like this. So as the author of the original amendment, um, is there any pride of authorship? Can we, can we lift that entire statement as written in the Scarborough resolution and install that in ours as number three? You can do whatever you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, David, I... I can you, oh, you, you made the original motion, so I believe you could accept Jessica's I amendment. Would just, mm -hmm. I would, I would uh, uh, basically amend my motion to include number three in uh, the opt-out uh, language that is currently in the Scarborough resolution, I as second. read by Jessica Solon in today's meeting. So can we pass this and ha with the understanding that you'll adopt the language for appropriate to Cape Elizabeth? Penny, did you want to say? I second. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Just one last point. I, I think I would echo the statements made by, I think it was Sarah Merrill. Uh, you know, I don't know quite what to think of all of this, frankly, um, but I, I see that there could be some benefits to just have more public education on the issue, uh, and hopefully it may set people's minds at ease or we'll, we'll come to a better result. So I really appreciate the time that the gentleman from CMP took to come here, as well as the folks who came to, to, uh, to speak their opinions as well. Uh, um, so I do plan to support the motion. I just wanted to um, ask, do we, did we already mo uh, make a motion to amend uh, the, um, the one, two, three, the fourth whereas? Yes. Um, yes did we already? Okay. Yes. Thanks. I just didn't want to forget that. So the motion includes the current draft with the fourth bullet, town council understanding that, and then the uh, provision three opt out. And it's been seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming to speak. <coughs>
the executive director or the president, whatever the title is, of the Scarborough Economic Development uh, uh, SEDCO. Uh, Eric Carson, who's the assistant city manager of South Portland, is also the economic development director for the city of South Portland. Where are you now, Karen? And Karen is uh, Karen Martin, a longtime Cape Elizabeth resident who's with the Scarborough Economic Development. And I think, Harvey, are you going to give an overview of this? <clears throat> and a resident of Glen Avenue that had power all night. <laughs> I, I was going to introduce myself as one of the only people who didn't lose power, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but good evening. I, my name is Harvey Rosenfeld, and I'm the president and executive director of the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation, known fondly, we hope, as SEDCO. I'm here tonight representing the newly formed Greater Portland Development Corporation. I'm here, and Eric is here, who is the Assistant City Manager and Economic Development Director in South Portland, and Karen, who has just joined our staff, but is also a Cape resident. We don't know why Eric doesn't live in Cape, but you know, what can you do? I really want to briefly review the creation of the organization and hope that you'll adopt the resolution before you in support of the, what we're calling the GPEDC, to save time. Uh, the origin of the effort began in 2007, when the staffs of the cities of Portland, South Portland, Westbrook, and the staff of SEDCO got together to participate in the Bio 2007 Biotechnology Trade Show in Boston. The brochure that I passed out came from that um, effort and continues as our effort to promote Greater Portland. The, the Bio 2007 show and, and subsequent shows are international trade shows that move around the country. But the size of each of these trade shows are, make them far too expensive for each community to participate in. That said, how are we going to attract new business ventures to our communities? Does a biotech company in Kansas know where Scarborough, Maine is? Well, the answer is probably not, but Greater Portland, Maine might catch their attention. We realized that our efforts in promoting our individual communities showed little in the way of progress. At that point, we shook hands, produced the brochure, and went to work as a group to get companies, specifically at that point, biotech companies, acquainted with Greater Portland. When the Metro Coalition got wind of where we, what we were doing and encouraged our efforts and suggested that we expand the effort to include the remaining members of the coalition, Cape Elizabeth and Falmouth, move on to legally incorporate and broaden our search to include precision manufacturing and information technology companies as our target groups along with bioscience. It should be noted right now that Greater Portland, despite the fact that it is the engine of the state's economy, has never had an organized group representing it. Uh, I think every place else in the country if you look at where activity is, is out there promoting itself, and we've never done a very good job of it. Working together has proved very positive. Besides getting the work out about the attributes of Greater Portland, we've worked together to get legislation passed that has enhanced our ability to bring new businesses to the area. Working together has really worked well for us. It's a cooperative effort, and it's a cooperative effort in an area that doesn't lend itself to regionalization. Um, the town of Scarborough doesn't provide funds for me to bring businesses to South Portland. They want me to bring businesses to Scarborough. But our organization has worked cooperatively together, understanding that growth in one community benefits the other communities. Our next step is to set our wheels in motion and go after out-of-state and out-of-country companies that will provide the type of, job that Maine, type of jobs that Maine needs. So why are we here tonight asking for your support? We think it's important to show that all the communities of Greater Portland are committed to the effort, to show that we're serious in this endeavor. We're not asking for any financial commitment at this time. We feel that we, again, working together, have found potential financial support to get this off the ground. Well, what's in it for Cape Elizabeth? Uh, reaping the benefits of this kind of cooperative effort does not require opening up your town to commercial development, but Cape residents <coughs> work in Greater Portland, and a healthy economy with a growing job sector helps ensure the stability of Cape Elizabeth as well as all Greater Portland communities. Also, we hear a lot about our kids having to go out of state to find work when they would rather remain here. 
if we are successful in our efforts to build the employment base in the communities of Greater Portland, then Cape kids may not have to leave the state to find meaningful and rewarding work. With that, I'll end. Hope that you'll support us, and I think all of us will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Uh, while he's before us at the podium, does anybody want to ask any questions? Right. Got a couple of questions. First, is, um, is there any in-state lobbying effort conducted by this group? No. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Uh, we don't compete with each other, but we make our presence known by some in-state shows, such as the Maine Real Estate and Economic Development Corporation and some other mm -hmm. uh, chamber of things. But our real thrust is to get out of, out of Maine. Uh, the majority of economic development in Maine is a company moving from one Maine community to another Maine community. That's probably 98% of economic development. It's great for the community that the company moves into. It, it's not great for the community it moves out of, and it doesn't do anything for the state's economy. So you, really, you don't really uh, <coughs> play a role in trying to affect business policies, policies, legislation within the state? Well, we have, yeah. Um, one of the things that happened when the, town, the state created the pine tree zones, it excluded Cumberland County. Uh, so we can't, couldn't use pine tree zones to attract business. Every place else in the state could. Uh, by working together, we lobbied the legislature and got them to change that law, and now we have pine tree zones. So, and that will continue. That's one of the roles that we see uh, the GPDC doing. Uh, besides marketing Maine, working with the legislative delegation, and providing some coordination between the communities in Greater Portland to get things done. Uh, how is the group funded, and is there any cost? Applied? We're not funded now. Uh, the four communities that started this have been shipping in to do the shows and do the marketing and produce the brochure. But as we note in the um, resolution, we have found sources of funding we think we can tap into at this point. Um, it would probably be disingenuous for me to say that we'll never come to the municipalities for money. We probably will. At that point, each community in Greater Portland will have the opportunity to opt in or opt out. But right now, we're starting this off. We expect the first year to find funding elsewhere, perhaps into the second year. And as this builds, and if we can show success, perhaps the communities will contribute to it. Just finally, here. But in what way will Cape's voice be heard? Will we be something to be on the board or yes. whatever? Yes. So each community will have a position on the board, and there'll be a report to each community at the end of each year on what we've done and hopefully accomplished. And will that be the town manager on the board? That would be a decision of the town council. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Are there any, all our questions for Good. any other questions? Thank you very much, sir. Do I, I assume, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Thank you. Um, is there a motion? One minute recommendation. Um, okay. Yeah, I would, I would, I would recommend I would, you, you, may I? I was going to say I'd like to have the manager. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to recommend you approve this with the understanding that it's with no uh, financial commitment from the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and and the, the reason I support this is, you know, I, I look at all of our revenues and uh, they, they keep, they continue to collapse, they continue to have problems. Cape Elizabeth does well, our schools do well, and the greater Portland region does well. Uh, if the, the rest of the communities have good positive economic development, their county taxes go up, ours don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it but mainly, there's an awful lot of Cape Elizabeth citizens who, who benefit from, uh, we, I think we all, we all benefit from the economic uh, uh, enhancement of Greater Portland. And we're not looking at this at bringing business into Cape Elizabeth. But yet at the same time, you know, I look at a building we have at Fort Williams, and if uh, there was a proper thing that they found that would fit that building, I'd, I'd love to see something in there to uh, bring in some revenue. Uh, when I say that building, I want to be precise. I'm not looking at building buildings in Fort Williams. I'm talking about yeah, you, building 326, <laughs> the larger of the two offices row buildings. So thank really? you, Ann. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for the clarification. So, okay, do I hear a motion so I'm gonna, now? I'd like to move the manager's recommendation that we support the Metro Coalition initiative relating to regional economic development. 
per, per this draft resolution? Yes. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay. Moving on is item number 125, which is a proposed PACE ordinance. The ordinance committee uh, has a recommendation, so I will be turning to the ordinance chair. Sure. Uh, PACE stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. So that's the PACE ordinance. The committee unanimously <laughs> Uh, recommended that we forward this to the town council and that tonight's vote will be on voting, voting to set it for a public hearing at our December meeting. Uh, just very generally, uh, this is a program, it's part of the stimulus package, correct Mike? Uh, and essentially uh, allows homeowners to obtain a low interest loans for energy savings improvements to their particular home. Uh, and some of the uh, kinks in the program have been worked out, kinks meaning some of the objections were that this loan program would mean that this particular loan would jump ahead of the bank's mortgage in terms of priority on the title to a homeowner's uh, property. And now the priority of this loan would be determined by the date that the mortgage is actually recorded. So it doesn't get any sort of special uh, treatment under the law, if you will. Uh, another issue that came along was that municipalities were originally tagged with administering this program. Well, now my understanding is EcoMaine is actually going to be the administrator for this loan program, so it would not be up to the town to do. However, in order for our citizens to qualify for these types of loans, we do need to pass this ordinance. So that's why it has come to us. Uh, to review and consider. So with that background, oh, and, and one last point, uh, a gentleman from EcoMaine did come to the Ordinance Committee meeting last month. His name is uh, Dean Fisher, I believe, and he will be, he's been invited to come to the, assuming we have a public hearing, to that night's meeting to answer any questions that any of us may have. It's the Efficiency Main Trust. Right? I'm sorry, Efficiency Main Trust, thank you. <coughs> uh, so that would be the administrator of the program. So, uh, with all that background in mind, I would make a motion that we set this ordinance for a public hearing at our next meeting in December, which is December 13th. 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 Okay. Is there a second? Seconded. Is there discussion? Jessica? Yeah, I've got a couple questions, and is this the right time? If we're going to have a public hearing, would we have a workshop at some point, or should I ask these questions now? I don't think we're going to have a workshop on it, so why don't okay. you go ahead. Oh, okay. Way. Okay. Um, let's see. On Article 4, conformity with the requirements of the trust, um, as this is written, I interpret this to say that the trust, we, we could sign on to this, basically, um, if we choose to do that, and the trust can change the rules without our involvement, and then we would have to comply with those rules. And, you know, I don't particularly like that. <laughs> but that's the way I read this. I don't know if, if anyone could Mike, enlighten me or... Yeah. Mike would like to address that. Yeah, th there's two options. One is for the municipality to run the program. Mm -hmm. One is for the, the, the main efficiency trust or efficiency main trust, whatever it's called, <laughs> to run the program. We, the ordinance committee is recommending that Efficiency Main Trust run the program, right. which will be hands off from the town from that point on. We just have to do an initial ordinance to allow it to begin, but, but you're correct. Thereafter, they change the rules. It's, it's, it's a state program. Uh, it really has nothing to do with the town. Well, and, and in that light, um, should, should that occur in the future, <laughs> Um, and I, I think I mentioned this before when this initially came up because this is not the first time this has come before the council. I think it was presented and then brought back. Is that um, we, um, because 
agent does not define, there's trust and there's the, um, um, the, um, you know, <laughs> not eco main. What did you just say? Efficiency main. <laughs> Efficiency main. Or agent. I mean, it seems to me that it's possible that um, we might ultimately be financially responsible for lots of administration. And also, my, and I have another question to Dave about, and uh, the ordinance committee about this, is that, um, and it's the question I had before, I think, is, is how is this sustainable, and has there been any more work on the sustainability? Because the funding of this is not clear. And what is being proposed is that the, the loan, um, the loan, what's the word, the financial word, well, when the loans are paid off, that that money would then fall back into the program. But to me, that's a big if. And so I'm kind of concerned about that, too, because, I mean, there's a possibility that this doesn't work the way it's set up to work. And so I'm concerned as to what our liabilities would be at that point. So. I, I don't, oh, go ahead. No, go on. I mean, I, I don't profess to be an expert, but I, I don't see in reading the proposed ordinance and, and based on my understanding of the program how any of this comes back to the town uh, by uh, adopting this ordinance. If that's what we do, we allow our citizens to participate in this loan program. Uh, but it, it, in my understanding is it, doesn't, it does not come back to the town. And in our conversation with um, Dean, was his name? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we asked specifically about the town's um, liability, and there is none. And we are basically just authorizing the state to make these funds available. <coughs> and to your second concern about if the money doesn't become available, mm -hmm. whatever happens in that respect, that just would create a limit on the amount of loans that are available. It still doesn't involve the town at all. Okay. And if I could just interject the second document we have, right. not the trust one, but the, the what is main pace and how our town's involved, about halfway down through, it says Efficiency Main will administer the program with no financial liability or cost to the town. So I am relying upon that statement in their description of it. When I, that's how I'll be basing my vote. I'm relying on it. And are, is, uh, are you, or the ordinance committee, and is the town manager confident that, um, this is under who administers the PACE program on page three, that the um, town uh, staff would not be overly burdened because we, it looks like, can be very easily called to administer and do all kinds of things in relation to processing these loans? Yeah, th thus far, 30 communities have adopted this program and every single community has adopted it with the municipality opting out of any administration. Okay. Uh, we, we truly feel that our, any burden of administration will cease as soon as we notify uh, Efficiency Maine that this has been adopted. Okay, thank you. Dave. And my understanding of what role the town would play would be that we would make information publicly available regarding the program on the town website or through the Cape Courier, et cetera, but that would basically be the extent of it. Any other comments? Okay. We had a, we had a motion and the right. second. Yes. Okay. So since there is no further discussion, all in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Our next item is item number 126, which has to do uh, with public participation provisions that the Ordinance Committee has come up with for its own meeting. So I will turn again to the Ordinance Chair, Dave. Yeah, I'm a little insulted that there's nobody here to watch <laughs> all of my presentations. <laughs> Amy's here. All to watch. Amy's, oh, Amy's oh, here. My apologies to the press. attention. <laughs> The, the big TV audience. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I hadn't thought about that. My 10-year-old um, son was making fun of me and the town council, and I said to tune in tonight, and you could see all the things that we do. So it's 9 o'clock, though he's probably asleep. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, we had a brief meeting of the ordinance committee last week before our town council workshop to discuss 
um, how we would deal with uh, and handle uh, public input in our regular ordinance committee meetings, and it's laid out in the memo. I, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have, but it's, I think it's relatively straightforward. Do you want to make a motion? I'd be happy to make a motion that the town council approve the uh, ordinance committee procedures and policies for public input during the regular meetings as drafted in our materials tonight. Second. I have one question. You said during the regu during your regular meetings, you, all you have is regular meetings, right? Yes, I just keep it, seeing regular in this draft. So it's just sort of just wanted down. to check. Yes. You don't really have workshops, that, as far as I know. So okay, just check. David has a lot of regular meetings. <laughs> he's, he's a meeting man. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion or questions? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next is item number 127, Planning Board Revised Rules. Mike, do you want to say anything about this? We have a memo from uh, the Planning Board Chair, but there is no one from the Planning Board who was available to come tonight to talk about their yeah. proposed rules. What you should have before you is a memorandum from Peter Hatem, the Planning Board Chair, dated October 29, 2010, that outlines uh, what they're proposing to change, and I'll go back to that in a minute. Uh, you then should have a document that shows what the rules would look like upon enactment, if they're enacted, and you also have a redlined version which shows all the different changes they're recommending. The primary change that they're recommending is that at every regular meeting of the planning board, the public would be allowed to comment <clears throat> virtually every time a particular issue comes up. Right now, they're only allowed to comment at the public hearing. If, if uh, you know, we were doing an, an addition to the town hall at the planning board meeting, none being proposed, but if we were doing one, <laughs> Uh, right now, citizens could only speak at the public hearing. They couldn't speak at the two or three other meetings that comes up. The planning board considered uh, allowing comments at <coughs> workshops. Uh, they received an opinion or a, uh, an advisory letter from a, an attorney at the Maine Municipal Association uh, who stated that you, you, you ought to be quite careful in allowing public comment at workshops because there's a court standard uh, that, the, that the main law court, Supreme Court, has looked at over the years that, that really gets into issues of when does a substantive review begin. And the planning board at this point is recommending being cautious and not allowing public comment at workshops because they're very concerned that the board would tend to get into such issues that then an argument would be made the substantive review had begun and then you get into all sorts of a host of other rules. Uh, so the, I think the council has really two options before it. One is to accept the planning board uh, amended bylaws. By this is, is, is in essence what the council's role in this, or to refer it back to the planning board uh, with suggestions or comments. Thank you. Ann. Okay. David. I admit I had a hard time finding the right documents as I was getting ready for tonight, and I never actually found the red line version of the uh, proposed changes. I think I've reviewed the final version, but when I opened up what I thought was the red line document, it looked like every single word had been crossed out, and so I just had a hard time figuring out what the changes were, though I did read Peter Hatem's memo, so I think I understand the, the, the basic concept. I also did speak with Peter uh, this afternoon and uh, he wanted to be sure that the council understood what it was the planning board was proposing. He unfortunately could not be here tonight. The vice chair of the planning board wasn't available, nor was Maureen O'Meara. So Peter said that if we want, and I'm not going to make a motion to table yet, but if we wanted to, we could hold off and, and deal with this agenda item at the December meeting when it's more likely than not that if Peter actually did say he would be available, then we could ask questions. So. I'm happy to do it that way. Um, I can just tell you from my six years on the planning board, it was very frustrating for members of the public 
uh, when an application was going through the process for a subdivision or site plan review, there was only one opportunity for public participation. And yet, that the applicant might appear at three or four meetings, and, and folks would just be dying to get up there to respond, because a lot of times there would be new information or, or amendments to a site plan that people wanted to comment on. So I, I endorse the planning board's uh, proposal. I'm just wondering if we're all comfortable enough tonight, if, if perhaps we would want to have that more give and take with Peter Hayden or the town planner and do this another day. Okay. Other comments or questions? I would support that point of view. Plus, it would give uh, the public an opportunity to be more aware of changes that are being proposed or ask questions at that time, too, I suppose, or make comments. I, and I agree with David as well because I have questions that I was hoping uh, Peter or Maureen or somebody was going to be here to kind of be able to address. So I would say if we can have it at a point in time when they could be here to answer questions. There was, any, and there was, yes, there any, Jim? was there any um, date certain or any need to have this done at this time? <clears throat> no. It, wasn't, it didn't, didn't appear to be. This is more around trying to comply with our overall communication strategy. Yes, we've asked every yeah, so, board and commission. So I, I'm in support of, of holding off and having a more uh, substantive discussion with the people who are doing this on, on a monthly basis. Any other? Be more. Sarah? Can I just clarify, was it, your it was my impression when I read through this that they're trying to make it as open as they can with as much exchange with the public as they can while staying within the law. So it's very much in keeping with our new communication strategy and it feels like it's what the, the citizens would embrace <clears throat> and feels to be aligned with what we're doing. Is that, did I read that correctly? I think that's absolutely correct. I, the, I think the, con the concern that I started to have here was it just didn't seem to me that it was clear from what was available on the website that people that are interested in this would really know what it was we were deciding tonight. Right. So that was my only reason. I agree with you, Sarah. I think it's completely in alignment with our policy. It does allow for more participation. That's all good. I just want to make sure that yeah. we have a firm, firmer understanding of what we're doing. And perhaps since the, the press is here, the press might highlight this issue, just saying that, uh, <laughs> we're, that we, the planning board is looking for input and the council is looking for input. Mike. Yeah, what I will do to try to help out is right now it's, it's in the, the council packet material in three separate documents. It, I think it's easier if you get the written document. What I'll do is we'll, the scanner wasn't working today, but we'll, we'll try to scan this in the next day or two and have it as one, one single document so it'll be easy to follow through it too. I think that would help. I'd like to add that, um, speaking only for myself, I found, uh, first of all, I applaud the planning board for ex expanding the uh, opportunities for uh, the public to uh, weigh in, uh, not just in writing, but in person, because I, I know that it has been very frustrating for some citizens who sit at meetings and just really want to say something and oftentimes have things that are very pertinent and would be helpful to the planning board but they haven't been able to say them. My concern um, in the cover memo was uh, and just this is just to give the planning board a heads up as to what one of my questions will be next month is this this idea about allowing only written comments from the public at the workshop stage. I read through the legal I wouldn't call it really an opinion, a legal opinion, but the advisory note from the MMA lawyer. And um, I'm not sure if there's not a way to get around that by having a separate meeting where they just hear input, close that meeting, and then start their meeting, another meeting immediately thereafter. Sort of like when we have a workshop and then we start our regular council meeting. They could have a public input session and then close that meeting and then one minute later open their regular meeting and, and that way maybe the way their uh, time limits ran could be gotten around, I don't know, if, they, if there are concerns about those. So I don't know, I've, I've never been on the planning board so I'm not in, at all an expert on this, but I'm just concerned that 
allowing only written comments at the workshop stage is the front end when, when citizens really, really want to speak about things and oftentimes hear, you know, hear things. So I think there might be an opportunity to let people participate immediately before the official workshops start. So, so in, in uh, just a question about that, if you had two items on your workshop agenda, would you have to advertise two public hearings? I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. So two separate items. I'm not sure this would be, a, it wouldn't be a formal public hearing. It would be a public input session is sort of my theory. But you'd have just, just to clarify before this confusion, the, the planning board's rules provide that the first time an item appears on the agenda mm -hmm. is when they notify folks. So this, if it, that is before a workshop. And it's that's, that's when they notify folks. Okay. Hmm. So. I may have confused things even further, but that's the question that's on my mind because I know a lot of people want to speak at workshops or before workshops or at the front end of the process when they feel they can affect the process more rather than waiting till further along when it gets to a formal meeting. So anyways, that's what's on my mind. But uh, Penny? Um, one of the things I had as a question really kind of builds off that because I know that one of the most effective um, workshop sessions that I had seen with the uh, planning board was when we were doing the agricultural ordinances and it became an exchange. You know, we were focusing on ordinances and it became a, a dialogue and an exchange and I, I think it really helped to expedite that process. So there could be types of agenda items that really are more conducive to uh, public input and public exchange, whereas others might not be. But that would, that's kind of, yeah, there are, spe I, I don't know what those rules, what the rules are, but there are special rules because the planning board is quasi, has a quasi <clears throat> right. judicial role. So I'm sure they can inf tell us more about that. <clears throat> Maureen can and I, we'll get more information next time, but so noted. I think you, you make some good points. Did, Jessica, did you have a point? Yeah, um, I, I'm also in favor of waiting uh, to the next meeting, and hopefully Peter Hayden will be here because I understand what they're trying to do, I think, but there just seem to be some logistical quirks that I think need more exploration for those very reasons that everyone has been stating. Now, I know David was talking about thinking about making a tabling motion, and the reason he didn't what, is that once you make a tabling motion, discussion has to stop. So if anybody else wants to say anything, now's the moment, because I'm going to turn for, to him for a tabling motion in 10 seconds. Eight, eight, seven, seven, six. <laughs> okay, here you go. All right. Make your uh, motion. I would move that we table item number one. Oh, my screen just went dark. We <laughs> table item number 127-2010 regarding the planning board revised rules to our next town council meeting, which is December 13th. Seconded. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. No discussion is allowed. Um, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a good discussion. And um, again, I do want to thank the planning board for all the work they've put into it and the planner. Um, and we look forward to having further discussion with them at our next meeting. Thank you. OK, item number 128 has to do with a report receiving a report from the Municipal Operations Review Committee. We had two members on that committee, two council members on that committee, and I don't know if one or the other of you would like to introduce this item. Uh, Penny and I discussed <laughs> Penny's, this Penny's briefly. a short-termer, so she, <laughs> she's, exactly. she's like, I'm out of here. You talk about and it, And David Dave. wrote such a wonderful movie. She um, made the gesture, so I think it's me, but she will fill in the, the gaps which I'm sure there may be some. Uh, this committee uh, met uh, beginning uh, in September of 2009. We had several meet committee meetings and several subcommittee meetings, and I do want to thank the members of the Municipal Operations Review Committee, fondly known as MORC, 
for all of their hard work. And I also want to give a special thanks to uh, the town manager and other town staff who participated in numerous meetings. Uh, this ended up being a pretty uh, challenging project for Mork. And the end result is laid out in the memo. I, I don't want to summarize every last piece. But we essentially felt that uh, we had gone about as far as we could uh, in the process uh, and unfortunately did not complete the work that we had set out to do. But due to a number of challenges, felt that it was appropriate to uh, disband, if you will, provide the council with my explanatory memo, provide the council with uh, the draft memo, of, which includes many recommendations. Uh, we also are giving the council some survey uh, results, uh, as well as a summary of the survey results. Uh, the decision to disband didn't mean that we didn't think what we had done was, had no value. Uh, rather, we just didn't think we were able to get everybody onto the same page, and it just didn't seem to be productive to keep meeting. And so out of respect for people's time, and out of the need to sort of bring it to a conclusion, we did what we did. And my hope is that as the council heads into 2011, that we can use some of the Mork report as, uh, to, to set some of our goals, because there are some very uh, uh, interesting and important recommendations. Um, but that's sort of the, the story of Mork. Uh, if any, yeah. uh, and the story, the story of Mork. Mork. Uh, and one, just one last uh, item. <clears throat> one of the great things about working on the town council is you end up working with people that you didn't know before, and you get to know them. And I, uh, you know, with Penny leaving the council tonight, it was really a pleasure to work with her uh, more closely on Mork. Um, I don't think. We ended up doing what we had set out to do, Penny. Uh, but I really enjoyed uh, your working with you on this committee. Thank you. I think one of the key things with Mork was that the scope was so broad to bring a group of people together and to hone in on what are the things that you can achieve and keep them at, uh, I guess, a manageable level. Um, I think for future reference, we need to ensure that scope is understood up front, or at least, uh, I think you identified it in, this, in the memo, David, at least brought back to the council, uh, this is our understanding, and then have it clarified a little more. But scope, definitely scope creep happened on this project. So. Okay. Okay. So I would well, be happy to make a motion. Please. Uh, that the Town Council receive the report of the Municipal Operations Review Committee and that we thank the committee for their work. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I would just like to add um, that I attended a number of those meetings and I know what a big project it was, what a difficult project it was, and I know all the, mem all the members worked very diligently um, and spend a lot of time and energy on this project and I want to thank them for their work and I want to thank our two counselors who, who did it, who worked on it too because it was a big uh, assignment. So, so, Mike? Just if I might, one brief comment. As, as I look at this, as uh, David said, there were some challenges along the way but, uh, you know, th there are some good recommendations in this report, you know, and I know just this evening uh, the council is moving on to a couple of items that are specifically recommended in this report. Uh, one is I look at the last recommendation, pool fees. Mork favors efforts to increase pool revenues. There's an opportunity to do that with, with an item later this evening. Uh, there's uh, the pay per throw. They, they recommended that you consider it. You ta you're taking the final action on that, on that this evening. Uh, leasing of space in buildings. Uh, there's been a more aggressive action at, at uh, leasing space. So recommendations are being uh, done. The thing I'd like to commit to is in about six months of taking their recommendations and providing an update to the town council on exactly what is happening. And even though they're not final recommendations, uh, you know, there, there are lots of things well worthy of consideration through the budget process and otherwise. And I think it's important that we look at them. Thank you, Mike. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further comments? Hearing none.
All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to item number 129, which is a um, has to do with uh, a slight change to the Alternative Energy Committee charge. Sarah, you are our liaison with that committee. Yeah, the like alternative. Sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. Can I give it a one minute background? Sure. The Alternative Energy Committee, as you know, has done great work for two years. They gave us that incredible report, a lot of which we acted on in terms of um, fixing up buildings and lights and doing things that were sort of short-term payback. I think that they're interested in one final year to take a look at part of their charge was longer-term um, solutions, alternative energy, reducing the carbon footprint in the town, um, sort of bigger picture thinking, not that they think we're going to implement it, but just to leave it there in the report for the council long term. Do you think that's a fair description? Um, Wyman Briggs has stepped up to head it up um, for the third year, which is nice. And uh, I think they're down one or two members, which maybe the appointments committee will have to look at. But in general, I would strongly encourage us to um, extend their charge for one more year. So um, I move that we um, extend the, the Alternative Energy Committee through the end of 2011. Okay. Seconded. As, and I would say as, as the changes as laid out in this draft before us, because there's Sorry. The, the draft. Some old language. We just there's said. some language about committee resources, uh, the $40,000 that's been Do already used. Repeat up. it again. Or just. I'm just noting that for clarification right. for anybody who might be watching. So. Um, okay, it's been moved, and I didn't hear. Was there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Comments? All in favor? Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sarah, for your work on that committee. That committee's done a lot of good work and will continue to, I'm sure. Okay. Um, item number 130 um, has to do with a grant. Um, for the Fort Williams Park Arboretum. Mike or Jim, do you want to say anything about this? Pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, I just want to mention Rick Churchill, who's a member of the uh, Arboretum the volunteer group, did most of the work on this grant one. Just want to say appreciate his efforts. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody want to make a motion? I uh, move that the town council um, Accept the grant of three thousand nine hundred sixty-nine dollars for the project canopy at Fort Williams Park. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? None. Okay. All in favor? Great. It's unanimous. Thank you. Please pass along our thanks to the uh, man who did all the, the heavy lifting on this. Mike, thank you. <clears throat> Item number 131 has to do with um, Riverside Cemetery Trustees, the Appointments Committee. Do you want to say anything about this, Penny? Yes, I will. Um, probably about um, three or four weeks ago, uh, one of the members of the uh, Riverside uh, Cemetery Trustees um, contacted me regarding um, term limits and the fact that um, currently, a member can only serve uh, two consecutive terms. The recommendation from um, the members was that this be extended to be three years. The, region, the rationale was that uh, kind of that institutional knowledge was important as decisions are being made um, regarding the cemetery, and so. Um, I would like to uh, make a motion that we um, include the trustees of the Riverside Cemetery um, in being able to have uh, three consecutive terms versus the two consecutive terms that they have today. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? 
Okay, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, Penny. <coughs> Thank you to the Riverside Cemetery uh, trustees and Deb. Thank you, or the uh, staff person who handles that. So, okay, uh, moving on. Item number 132 has to do with the Don Richards pool. Mike, do you want to say something about this? I didn't. I didn't give you any materials on this other than uh, what's on the agenda itself. The, there's this system at the pool called the Colorado Timing System, and what it is, it's a bunch of boards that are in at the end of the pool that when the when the swimmers go and they hit their hands on it. You know, if you remember the Olympics when uh, uh, Michael, whatever his name was, <laughs> Phelps, Phelps, Phelps hit it, you know, our swimmers want to do just McGovern. as well. McGovern. <laughs> our swimmers want to do just as well. And anyway, but the boards, that, I, I, I saw them down the pool, they're all falling apart. And they tried to repair them, you know, last year, and it, it's, it's seedy looking. Uh, <laughs> But, but anyway, you know, there was a possibility that maybe this group could put in a little, and, you know, I look at it, it's our responsibility to take care of the fundamental elements of the pool. And this is a fundamental, fundamental element of the pool. And within the 710 accounts, the, the, the capital outlay accounts, you, you, you appropriate by uh, uh, the whole department. But yet, you know, within the capital outlay, you know, particularly for something that's not absolutely necessary, I don't feel right. Ex exceeding any one item or starting a new item, uh, particularly starting a new item without, uh, without your authorization. So anyway, I'd like you to say it's, it's okay to spend up to 7000 for repairs to the, the timing system. Again, not asking for an additional appropriation. And secondly, uh, Andrew, the new pool director, uh, is just an excitable person, wants to try different things. And he, he, he worked at a pool in Tasmania and uh, a couple of other pools along the way. But in Tasmania, he had a system <laughs> where he actually, it was sort of half privatized. He got the profits from the pool. So he, he had to be very innovative in making sure he people came seen. to the pool. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not offering that, him, that here. <laughs> we have a different system. But yet, they have these, these uh, you know, like inflatable pool devices that you actually put in the water. and. He feels, and, and they're not cheap, they're about $8,000 to, to get a couple of series. We've tried to pin them down on exactly which one he wants, and we're not quite there yet. But anyway, he thinks you get the money back as close as six months, because it, the pool becomes so much more popular. So many people want to have parties, because the, these are the, the best thing in town. What, but what, what, what is, is it? it? It's, it's, it's a <laughs> slide. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a slide. slide. Oh, oh, yeah. oh all right. Yeah. And okay. the slide is set right up in the pool. You go down the slide. That's and cool. It's, uh, you know, and it, they're very <laughs> cool. They're in all these different <laughs> colors. It's a party. It's a you know, they're, they're, <laughs> workshop. They're almost like the colors of Sarah's eyeglass case here, these things. <laughs> I mean, he said he had such demand that he would literally have to have time slots where kids would yeah. line up outside the door and wait, and he'd divide it into, what, 20 minutes, where yeah. each group yeah. would come in, pay use it, be done, and the next one. So it's kind of the water equivalent of bouncy yes. houses. It, it, it's yeah, an absolutely. amusement park. That's all it is, it's a music I, I, I think he's optimistic on the, the, the payback period, but I still think the payback period is within a couple of years. Uh, and therefore, you know, with the, the pool season coming, I think it's time to, to uh, you know, we're, we're having revenue problems at the pool and at the fitness center and at a couple of other entrepreneurial areas. And it needs a boost, and I think this would do it and would encourage you to authorize the purchase. So this is your recommendation? It is. I want to see you on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jim and the master swimmers are going to be there. <laughs> 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 but again, he is very enthusiastic about it. He leased the pool in Tasmania yeah. from the government, and that's how he was able to profit share with them on that. But I mean, he's a very enthusiastic guy. I think he's got he's got the right approach. Clearly, I, I try to pin him down on his payback analysis, and he couldn't he couldn't give me anything that I could take to this meeting. In fact, he didn't like the two or three emails he got from me about, you know, I need something a little substantive here to, to go and say $8,000 is, is a good investment. He's Talk an idea little, man. He definitely <laughs> is. But he has implemented a lot of really substantive changes to the operation that I think we can all look at and feel good about. But the other piece of this is where are the boosters in all of this? You know, where do they stand? That was one of my questions to him. This Colorado um, timing system, if you bring a swim team for a meet, 
to our pool, you have to have confidence that the timing system is accurate because there are state championships on the line here and a lot of the insulation is gone and deteriorated because of the chlorine and not being maintained correctly over the last 10 years. And that was the other question I got, Adam. If you get new stuff, what's the maintenance plan? Because, uh, but he's got good, I think he's got a good head on his shoulders in terms of what he's trying to accomplish for us because we do need revenue there. <laughs> that, that raises a question. It, it, is, are there any ongo increased ongoing costs that you have any sense of how big those would be and, and whatever they are, I presume you'll build them into the budget in the coming year. You know, the, 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 I think if you have a device like this, I think you, you might need an extra lifeguard to be there to make sure people are using it safely. Okay. You know, I, to be honest, you know, he said six months. I wrote in here, it is believed that it will pay for itself in two years. You know, it's, it's a risk. You, you don't know that. Uh, but, just you know, some questions. It's, uh, the pool, it, it, it's the, we, we've got some real challenges with the revenues right now. Okay. And community services it, itself, too. Jessica? Um, I'm not opposed to the idea and concept, but I'm not confident that how we are taking in cash at the pool has improved at all from the last time I was there and saw the system and there was no one there and I just put my money in and I could have taken it all out of the box. So my concern is, is if we do, uh, first of all, this is a uh, current concern, number one. Number two, if we were to purchase this device and have a lot more revenue coming in, how is that cash going to be handled? Because I think we've got an issue right now. Yeah. If, if I might, we discussed at the department head meeting this morning uh, that for both the pool and the fitness center, we're going to begin accepting credit cards. Remember the date, Deb? January. January, the first of January. And that's, you know, one thing we're hoping is many more people use the pool on a <coughs> credit card basis. Uh, and, and this pool also is going to, it's also going to have ID cards with, uh, you know, barcodes and we, we're really looking at enhancing the, the financial controls of the pool uh, and, and having much better membership record keeping systems so that, you know, we, we don't have folks, you know, continuing to use the pool after the membership has expired. We've had some challenges in that area. And we need, you're, you're correct, Jessica, we need to address them. Okay, and the other, the other thing I'd like to ask about is, um, again, I think it's a very interesting idea, and I'm, you know, I love the pool myself, but um, do we, does this, is this device, is this slide being used anywhere else locally in New England or something? I mean, I'd like to see some numbers, and, and you know, I'm before, you know, approving $8,000. I mean, uh, there, there, surely there are some other towns or cities in the United States where they might have one of these and maybe they could help us with projections. You know, I discussed it with Janet Hoskin, who's his immediate supervisor. And, you know, we, we need to pin down exactly the devices that we're buying. And, you know, I don't, we don't lay out $8,000 without checking references and checking other places and, and Really being used, you know, I, I looked at the website and you know for the the one he suggested they, they listed 20 of these different devices, and you know there were there were different qualities. Obviously, what we'd be getting is the top level commercial grade to be sure that you know we're taking the precautions with safety. But no, we will definitely check uh, references and uh, other places that they're being used to, and particularly hopefully that you know they've been used for several years, so we know how durable they are and. Uh, that uh, they meet our needs. Okay. I, I was going to make a motion, but it looks like there are more people who oh. want to talk. So I just have Fair. one incredibly quick thing to add. I think his concept is that he really wants to ramp up full, full family memberships. So this wouldn't be where you just put the cash in the box. He's trying a lot of innovative ways to get little kids in there, because that's really what's lacking, is the little kids go in and go, Mom, Dad, this is great, we've got to go. <coughs> He's trying to get classes from Pond Cove and Middle School in there and gym. And just increase exposure so little kids love the pool and they ask their parents to join because that's where you really make the money. And I, my understanding was that this was part of that larger concept to n n not enough families are signing up for family memberships, which is, I think, $1,000 a year. And that's what I think he's driving at, to get more kids to the open swims and therefore more families to join. 
I want to say one other thing on uh, Councillor Sullivan's comments about the, the cash controls. We, we did, as the Council is aware, have uh, our auditors look at cash controls across our, our departments. And I think we had the meeting, was that with you tomorrow? Uh, with Deborah tomorrow on that. She, hers was, was delayed a little bit because of the election. Uh, but, but I've met with Bob Malley. We've gone over all the different issues involving Fort Williams. And we've, we've enhanced uh, procedures there when we empty out, you know, funds from the donation boxes. I've met with uh, the, the uh, chief of police and with Ed Hunt, who handle all the money at the, at the uh, uh, police department. Uh, the, the one that, you know, I haven't heard back from Janet for an appointment yet, so I, 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 I'm glad you mentioned that. It reminds me that I need to call her tomorrow and, and again go over uh, the, all the procedures that they're using at the pool and the fitness center for cash. Right. Question: Does the pool still rent out uh, for parties? And yes, it does. Yeah. So this would be a perfect add-on yeah, to that. Is, probably attract more people. He would ideas use this with that too. Everybody all set? Hey, David. Um, I would move that we authorize the expenditure of up to seven thousand dollars for repairs to the timing system at the Donald Richards Pool. And I would also move that we authorize an expenditure of up to $8,000 uh, for the purchase of a safe inflatable device for the pool. And I'm making that second motion on behalf of my 10-year-old son, who I know is definitely asleep, but I think <laughs> this would be awesome. So enough, am, enough you're, editorializing. You're, and you're quoting him, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? I think it will be awesome. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for answering our questions. And we look forward to updates when we get more details. Okay, item number 133 has to do with pay per throw, or also known as pay per bag. Uh, Penny, you're the... Oh, I have to person. say something about this. I go, just no, make the motion, you, can I? You can just make the yes. motion. Um, it's, not it's that I'm excited about this one. Um, <laughs> you, you feel free to say <laughs> as little as you want. About it. Okay, good. Um, as many people know, the council has had this um, as one of their uh, priorities to look at revenue opportunities um, in uh, at the transfer recycling center, et cetera, and pay to throw paper bag was one of those potential opportunities. Um, after uh, much research and discussion and uh, input at public hearing, uh, the council would, I would make a motion that the council confirm its intent to not implement pay to throw at this time. Is there a second? Just a second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, Penny, for your work in this area. Frank, I know you put in some extra number crunching in this area, and um, I want to thank Bob Malley also for his help and members of the recycling <clears throat> committee who um, have helped us clarify our thoughts on, on this issue. So, Item number 134 uh, has to do with implementation of the comprehensive plan. Mike, do you want to introduce this, or yeah, do we want to just It really motion? came out of the Ordinance Committee, so I would defer it to whoever they would like to speak on it. Uh, David? I Frank? feel like I've been talking enough, and, and uh, Frank actually did a great job on Excuse me, just <laughs> because of Jessica. I couldn't, I couldn't get it to come up on my, on my uh, screen. Help yourself. Here. Thank you. It's, I, I don't function very well after 9.30 at night. But I in any event, um, there, there is a flow chart for how we deal with the open space recommendations in the comprehensive plan. And I really appreciate the hard work that Frank Irvinelli put into preparing this draft and this very understandable flow chart, as well as the narrative that comes after it. We had a discussion about it at the workshop last week, so I would just leave it at that. If anybody has any questions, Frank or I or Jim would be happy to answer them. But otherwise, I would move that. Shall I make a motion? 
Yes, you can just, okay. or you can, you don't even have to say all the words. You can just say as outlined. Okay. I would, whatever. I would move that we, that the town council proceed with the recommendations set forth in the uh, memorandum and flow chart as uh, uh, prepared by the ordinance committee and uh, set forth in our materials this evening. Right. Including conf confirming the intent regarding the comprehensive plan and implementation. Yes. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. Then moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none. Could I? Oh, sorry. Oop, no, I. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, look at that! Just right into the wire. I should speed that up. Yeah. Oh. Whoa! Whoa! Come on. Hearing Apple one. Down. Hearing one. <laughs> I. Apple down. I I I notice that um, there is you know. Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is mentioned, and of course the Conservation Commission is mentioned. And I just want to go on record as saying that I, I truly believe that uh, the Cape Farm Alliance plays a significant role in uh, the work that's going to be done here. But they aren't, this is I keep looking for the, there is D. A text. D. D. They're in the text. Oh. They're in it's D. Been, it's been Invite the Farm Alliance relevant community groups to okay. undertake the following. Okay. I, I, I scanned this several times today and I couldn't see Cape Farm Alliance and I kept looking for it. So uh, as long as they're in here, uh, because as I said, I think they play a significant role in helping to define this. They are um, an important we player are and they are in the house. Yeah, so. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh, the next item is item number 135, which has to do with the leasing the upstairs portion of 343 Ocean House Road. Mike, do you want to yeah. say something? Last month, Greg Miles, the facilities uh, director of the school department, brought forward uh, a lease for a small space downstairs, Jamie Wagner, uh, rented that space. Uh, this evening, uh, we're, we're looking at re bringing the upstairs back to a residential quarters. Uh, again, Greg's been working on this with, with James Ridley, uh, who's a, a school employee, uh, but, you know, which is good. It's good to have, uh, you know, access for employees to live close to their place of work. Uh, and this is a lease of the, the space upstairs. It's for $850 a month. It's for, it's for a year. Uh, there's no guarantees of renewal. Uh, but we feel uh, this would be very good. The revenues do accrue to community services, and they can definitely use the support in their budget. Uh, Greg's also working with another prospective tenant for the other small space downstairs. So we've gone from no revenue in this building to, you know, the potential of uh, you know, up around fifteen thousand dollars or so, uh, in the course of two or three months. That's great. That's great work on his part. Yep. Do I hear a mo thank you? Do I hear a motion? Come on, it's not that late. Somebody make a motion. <laughs> Sarah, uh, I move that we um, authorize the town manager to execute a lease with a rent of eight hundred dollars per month for the property at 343 Ocean House Road. Is there a second? Second. And moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Michael, um, will he pay his own utilities? Not, not fully because they're not sep totally separately metered. It's the ones that are outlined in the lease he pays and the ones that, out outline that are not outlined in the lease. It's, it's all in one central system, so it's difficult to okay. segregate. And is he allowed one parking space or two with the unit? Uh, he, he is allowed, I believe, one, I believe it is, but, you know, that's, there's plenty of space out in back, too, so it's really not an issue. Okay. All right. Just, just curious, that's all. Okay. No, as long as, yeah. The we, we want the, the tenant to, to be comfortable. Okay. And if it's two parking spaces, that's not an objection. Right. Any other questions? Or discussion? I'm losing it. Did we have a mo yes, 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 Sarah made the motion. That's right. It's coming back to me now. Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. I'm approaching my 
bedtime too, so I'm starting to lose my focus. One more item. One more item, yes. Okay, item number 136 has to do with a pr proposed fee increases for the picnic shelter at uh, Fort Williams. Mike, do you want to say something about I'd, this? I'd love to. The staff would like that <laughs> if we ask this item to be tabled to your December 13th meeting. Uh, the reason being the chair, I think it was the chair of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, mm -hmm. discovered on Friday that the, sh the sheet that we had given them to consider the rate increases from was not the current sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a result, uh, it needs to be, uh, we need to come back with the right sheet. Okay, somebody want to ask Mike, be before we make a tabling motion, is there anybody who wants to ask Mike any questions? We're also going to come back next month with a recommendation on the beach to beacon road race. Okay. So nobody wants to ask any questions? Okay. Somebody want to make a tabling motion? I move that we table this item to uh, next meeting in December. Okay. Is there a second? Second. I just wanted to make, if I could, you're in doubt. The Ford Committee is going to be considering this at the next meeting if anyone has any <clears throat> interest in it. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. There's no discussion allowed per Robert's, Robert's rules, or the town council rules. Um, so all in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. Um, that concludes our formal items. Now is the time, the second opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. If anybody wants to come forward or say anything, the manager's a citizen, so he can say Yeah, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the Shore Road pathway, because I got a call from a reporter just before uh, the meeting this evening from the Press Herald, and, you know, I always get nervous with something as complicated as the Shore Road pathway, and because so many councillors have different positions uh, on it, I just want to be sure that I can explain what I said to the reporter and the status of where we are and where it stands. The, the town council approved the shore road pathway. They approved uh, local dollars for it only to the point of uh, the, the engineering studies, the monies that were already appropriated. Uh, the town is applying for two grants. One grant was to pack through their regular biennial process. We did not receive direct funding from that. We also applied through a program through the Safe Route for Schools. That decision is made in the spring. I think Jim Kearney had, a, had an email in the newspaper about that. Uh, it was, uh, excuse me, a letter to the editor of the Courier. Uh, he also said in the, the Courier that they have raised 75000 to date. Uh, they, we, they being? Uh, being the, 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 whatever the name of the group is that's raising money for the Shore Road Pathway. Safe. Safe. Safe Cape. Okay. During the PACS process, they set up a process, and I, I said, said this in an email to the council, uh, that if the town did certain work on state, the state roads, i.e. Route 77, we would get a credit back for 10% of what we spent. We spent $400,000 on the portion of the strip down here and out towards the end by the sea. We, we were allowed to get a $40,000 credit back, but it is only for a project that is already applied for to pass. So it can only go towards the shore road pathway, or we forego it. So we, f we forfeit we forfeit. Well, we forfeit it. But there's also that little heater space that has been in and out of the, of the uh, which I didn't talk to the reporter about, but the, the little space between, uh, you know, the, the shore road pathway plan actually showed that it began down around uh, Dr. Johnson's right. and didn't come up and around. We, there is a design, which the council hasn't seen yet, because it really wasn't done, for that other little section that goes here. Remember, at, at a time, there was a question about how we apply for that little section in money. Hmm. It, it, and, it, and it can be a legitimate debate. There would be a debate of, is that part of the shore road path, or is it not? You're gonna, you might have to face that issue sometimes. Because if the shore road pathway doesn't, in and of itself, go, we might will be looking at that $40,000 as trying to fix up the sidewalks here. Because while we can argue whether or not it's part of the Shore Road pathway or not, PACs would probably argue that it is. And it's one of these, you know, every time we deal with that little heater space, 
we're, we're caught we're, what, we're what, caught in the middle. You keep calling it the heater I just, space? It's, I call it a heater space. It, it's, the heater it's neither space? here nor there. Oh. It, it's, it's the little connecting piece <laughs> between something new between the community center driveway okay. and the town center. And so we're, we're basically talking about the sidewalk yeah. from the doctors it, yes. to, the, to it, the bank. And it was originally due to be funded by the town, and then it wasn't due to be funded by the town because there wasn't enough money to do all those things. Then it was discovered that the Shore Road pathway didn't go quite to the center of town. And remember, we agreed to add at the last minute that money just in case there was grant available. And see, so there's sort of a, an elasticity here of we consider it when it's appropriate for our needs and we consider it when it's not appropriate for our needs. And what the reporters end up writing, you know, they have as much difficulty explaining it as I, have, as I do. So you probably read in the newspaper that we've received a $40,000 grant for the Shore Road Path. Whether or not, you know, but I haven't specifically told PACs, we haven't worked on any details on how that might be used. So but they have said it has to be used for the Shore Road Path. And I, get, I get an email from Sarah who said she didn't want to use it on that section because she was concerned with some design issues. And I understand that, but it, it's, it's an issue at some point we're going to be working out, but I want to make sure anything you read in the newspaper, <laughs> the council has not set a policy on how that 40,000 is to be used. So and and it was, this was Dennis Hoey of the Press Herald, and Dennis doesn't cover Cape Elizabeth anymore, he used to, and whenever we deal with different reporters every week, they, you know, they don't know the whole history of things, I just get very nervous about what might be written. So I just want to make sure I understand. Particularly because it's confusing. We have this $40,000 credit because yes. of the work we did, yes. $400,000 worth of work. Right. And that can only be used on for something, to, we applied for for something that's been already applied for to PACs. Yeah. Is there anything else we've already applied no. to? So the shore road path is the only that's thing the that only it would be eligible, for. eligible for. And if we don't spend it it's gone. on that. Do we have a certain then, period of time in which it has to be spent? I haven't asked PACs that yet because I, I, sometimes you don't ask questions because you, you, you don't want to be boxed in. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any questions for Mike on this? Can, can the, uh, the Shore group use that 40 in their calculation of the matching monies they need to generate? In, in part, probably, but, you know, I, I'm not authorized to ask that question yet by the council. And I'm not asking you for a decision tonight. No. I just want you no, to... No, because it wasn't even on the no, agenda. No, it's not. This is and more information. This, this, is a, this is an update, and, you know, as much as say that, you know, you may, you know, you, you have so many different people that speak for the Shore Road Pathway. Mm -hmm. And in the end, only the council speaks for the Shore Road Pathway by whatever votes that you do at any given time. Can I just ask a really quick question? Sure. Can we use that in any portion of the Shore Road Pathway? In other words, could we use it for the pedestrian light at the beginning, or is it specifically for that... That would have to be negotiated with PACs, but that's what that's one thing we're looking at is if we don't get the big grant, you know, the, the very big one, maybe it could be used along with some matching monies for a section. for a small section of something that relates to the short rope now. Okay. And you will keep us updated as, as things time goes develop. On. Okay. Hmm. Okay. And I'm 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 not looking for any answers. I'm only trying to, to do a uh, Keep seven people from doing that. Keep a defensive mechanism. Well, I, I think we exceeded your three minutes, Mr. Citizen, Thank on you. that one, but that's okay. Um, okay, um, up before we adjourn, I just want to point out we have upcoming meetings, uh, Town Council Workshop on December 6th, um, which has to do with Council goal setting, and then our regular Town Council meeting is on December 13th. And counselors, I just would ask you, I know it's late, but just to hang around for like three minutes after the meeting so we can compare calendars for trying to schedule the, uh, co the new council orientation and council caucus. And Penny, you get to go home three minutes earlier than the rest of us. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you very much, everybody.